thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak here today uh, at this wonderful conference with so many young people. I hope that this uh, small introductory video could tell you a little bit about what I'm advocating for tonight, which is to build cities for people. And we are, in fact, in a paradigm shift of planning around the world. Wherever I come and work in different cities around the, the, the world, I do sense that we are shifting gear, so to speak. We are leaving the area where city building and city planning was all about systems optimization and developing infrastructure to now understanding that cities need to be about the way we live and the quality of life for people. It's time for us, uh, all of us as professionals, to rethink the way we build cities. Because if we start and continue building the types of cities in this image, people are no longer visible. And I would argue that people are the ones that make up cities. And we need, we need to find mechanisms of making cities come alive. We need to refocus on people. We need to understand their needs and their behavior. We need to look very carefully at what they, what they need now and in the future. We need to figure out where do people meet and what makes them happy, as we talked about earlier today, and where do they live now and in the future. How can we, in fact, live together and use the city as our extended living room to our homes? I think we all know that we have entered the era of cities. The cities are the growth engines of the world. And when we look at how growth is, is uh, happening over the next years to come, we can see that this growth is happening especially in your part of the world, in Asia. So the cities are becoming bigger and bigger. And when we look at how people then transport themselves in these cities, we can see that much of the extra traffic that we will be looking at in the future will be in urban areas and it will be in developing countries. So how do we use our creativity? How do we become innovative so that we can make people move about in cities in a smart way and in a, in a way that is also a high quality of life? Our biggest challenge today is to be build cities for all. And I think this question is even more relevant here in Hong Kong, where the affordability is questionable, similar to New York and London. So when we start looking at people, we need to understand the very needs of, of, of the human being. And we have basic needs, senses, we orient ourselves through cities by the, by the things we look at, what we, what we smell, what we touch, what we hear, what we feel is attracting uh, us in different directions. But we also are social creatures and we like being together with other people. And even though uh, a large percentage of the urban population today live alone, we are social in, by nature and we are seeking those places in the city that fulfill this social need of ours. And this social need is basic. It's a basic need. It's not necessarily only defined by culture. This image is from France. And as Jan Gill has said uh, in his entire life, man is man's greatest joy. And I could have taken this image as well in India and probably also in Hong Kong and Australia or Brazil. We all meet and gather in small groups, in larger groups. This is where we feel connected to others. And when there is a talk about resilience now in cities more than ever, due to all the uh, events that has happened, Sandy, the, the Sandy in, in New York and so forth, and the typhoons in this, uh, in this region, what makes cities resilient is actually the community and the network between people. 
Jan was in the movie short a while ago talking about a 60 kilometer an hour environment. And this is all over. This is an international language. These two images is one from Sweden and one from Dubai. But I could have probably taken this image as well in Hong Kong. And these types of environments that we are designing in our cities are limiting people contact. I'm very worried when I look at Chinese cities today, but also other cities, that the streets are disappearing. What we are building is basically segregated, gated communities. There is a lack of sidewalks. And the fact that our streets as a social infrastructure is, is missing, and we are turning these streets into roads, I think is one of the biggest social experiments that we have done in our history as a mankind. We need to undo the dinosaurs of the past. And I'm actually spending a, a large percentage of my time when dealing with city planning to take down some of these failures of the 60s planning paradigm. We need to figure out how to cater and how to design the five kilometer an hour uh, environments that Jan Giel was talking about in the movie here. And the five kilometer an hour uh, environments are the ones where we can hear each other, there is a nice air, there's many details, there is low sound levels that you can in fact talk to each other. Basically, there is a possibility for human interaction. And when we have spaces of this kind, I believe that we have a glue in society because then we have public spaces where people can actually come together. Public spaces for all. And this is where the space outside of your living quarter becomes your extended living room. This is where society melts or society is formed. And this is why public space is such a fundamental element of every society. I think I went to uh, Cape Town once uh, and did a public space strategy and I have never been touched so deeply by being in a city where um, public space was removed for a period of time. This is so essential. Also for a city like Hong Kong, with this type of density, you need to create wonderful spaces and streets where people can live their lives. So, does design affect behavior? Of course it does. People are invited to walk or cycle or take the transport mode that they are most uh, likely to by invitation. You can never force people to do anything, but you can become very careful in your invitations. Can relatively small investments make a large impact? in pedestrian infrastructure. It sounds tiny, but it makes a huge difference. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. You saw already this example in the film from New York, where this pilot project process was, uh, was introduced. Only 8% um, of the actual uh, people uh, or vehicles in the space were cars. And yet only 11% of the space were for the, for, the, for the many people that were there. And you can see in the little image on the side how people were standing cramped on the, on the traffic islands in the middle of Times Square. So by transformation over a summer, we were able to show how the city could be transformed. And what is so interesting about this, uh, this project is that in fact the traffic, uh, the traffic flow was improved with 18%. 74% were applauding the design, even though this was no, not a design. This was not fine Chinese granite. This was not landscaped. It was purely a new geometry of space. And that tells us that people are attracted to other people because they, they rated this space of higher quality just because of this reconfiguration. And another example was Herald Square, before and after. I think we need to think about our cities differently. I think we, we need to think about them as an orga, or, organism. We need to test things, 
measure how it works, and constantly refine uh, what, what we are building. And this is a new idea for architects, because we are used to looking at our buildings as artifacts. And we design them, we build them, and they're finished. But we actually need to understand that the city is a living organism, and we need to constantly measure how are the things we implement impacting our culture, and how can we constantly redefine and reconfigure. When we are doing this, what are we in fact measuring? I don't know any city in the world that doesn't have a transport department, and that doesn't have a, a lot of figures on cars, and economic growth, and environmental impact measures, and all the things that we can normally measure. But I don't know any city in the world that has a department for city life. Why not? I don't know any city that, has, uh, that, that is kind of constantly measuring people numbers, pedestrian numbers, participants in different things, the cultural changes that are happening. We need, I think, as professionals and planners, when we are dealing with cities, to make people visible. We are not visible in the way that we are planning cities today. Another example, just to show you that this mechanism or this process was not only applied to big cities and wealthy cities like New York. This is Mar del Plata in Argentina, where we tried the same method, looking at people's behavior, and then you can see here the differences with 74% uh, of everybody in that space uh, were moving in a tiny area of only 17% of the, of the actual um, space available. So by engaging people, by having dialogues and workshops and letting people be the active shapers of their environment and using the city as a testbed, we were able to have this dialogue with the politicians that you can see looking into what is happening and looking at the changes of their city. We changed 12 uh, little parking spaces into a, a lot of seating in this area, increased the space for people with 40%. And what was fantastic was that, as in New York, people were streaming out into this area. And this is when people then come together, and this is when you can imagine falling in love with someone in a space. <laughs> Another lesson learned from Copenhagen, my hometown, I think is important, because change can happen quickly with this pilot project process, but change over a long period of time is, of course, even stronger. And Copenhagen has changed over a 40 to 50 year period. This is how the city streets looked Back in the 60s, um, after the Second World War, cars were floating into the spaces and the streets of the city, and the cycle culture that we had had was diminishing. However, in the 70s, we had an oil crisis, and the energy prices went up, and people were not allowed to use their cars. So people were out fighting, demonstrating to have bicycle infrastructure. And ever since then, the city of Copenhagen has implemented a super fine grain bicycle network now over the whole city for 45 years. And today, 35% of everybody is now bicycling to work in Greater Copenhagen. I know this is not Hong Kong, 7 million, or Shanghai, or anything like it. Copenhagen is only 1.5 million people. But yet, I do think that design matters, and I think you can achieve, um, to some extent, some of these results as well here. And interestingly enough, <laughs> Copenhageners are crazy. They continue cycling at winter. And this is when something uh, interestingly happens, because this you can say, this is very strange Scandinavian behavior. <laughs> but I would say, no, this is culture. Because what has happened over these 35 years is that people have started to cycle. And they have actually created a culture. And that culture is now so strong that everybody, even though it's snowing 
for 70% of everybody, even though it's snowing or raining or with harsh winds, people are still continuing biking. So this is when design and infrastructure actually influences our behavior and creates a strong culture that will enable people to do what is best for them, for the city, and for the globe at the same time. To me, the most important thing, though, is not traffic. The most important thing is that people has changed uh, the, the character of the, of, of the city. People are now visible in, in the streets, people walking, people cycling, people bathing in the harbor. Now, Copenhagen is a livable city because it's alive. You see the other. It's a city full of people. It's a city full of faces. And a few years back, I was uh, advising the city of Copenhagen on their new vision. And now they actually have a political vision to be a metropole for, for people, to be the best city in the world for people. And then I think we cannot achieve anything more as planners than to have politicians to vote for something like that. Looking back to Asia, we have been working for the past seven to eight years with the Energy Foundation in uh, Beijing. And uh, di Director uh, Jin Yang Wang here is saying that um, the latest focus in China on the new towns is changing. And what we will be looking at for the next decade in front of us is actually the revitalization of our existing cities. So this is your challenge, I think, in this part of the world, to now look at what you've done and look at what, you, your, what you've built for the past 10 or 20 years and start revitalizing that so that it becomes a high quality of life for people that lives here. It's time to show a different, a different type of space and life between buildings where we can have cyclists, we can have pedestrians, we can have life in the ground floors, we can have trees back in the streets, we can have less traffic space and much more space for people so that the cities can come alive again. We are in the area of cities, and if you as professionals help focusing on what is our communal space, our shared space, this is when you can design societies to enable people to have a quality of life. Thank you so much.